Well, hello, hi. So uh, this is an incredibly broad topic. Uh, let's start in media stress. And I would like to kick off with a very simple question. Is there enough regulation and enough accountability in fintech? Do you want to possibly start, Louise? Um, my view is there's a huge spectrum of accountability. Absolutely everybody has a dog in this fight. As a rich stew, to mix my metaphors, of leg regulators and legislators, we haven't got a time to roll call them all. Um, but at the Financial Conduct Authority, we've got the vim and vigor of Nikhil Rathi, who's just getting his toes under the table as chief executive. This is a man who gets data. He's just come in from the London Stock Exchange Group, uh, which lives and dies uh, by data. And I expect him to be demanding much from his team at the FCA in this regard. Him plus uh, Charles Randall, the chair of the FCA, make a very formidable combination. Watch this space. We've got the muscularity of Andrea Costelli, who's been uh, reappointed as the CEO of the Competition and Markets Authority after reportedly winning a very high stakes game of it's him or me with Andrew Tyree. Uh, Alok Sharma backed Coscelli and Lord Tyree stepped down a mere two years into a five year term. So who's gonna be the next chair? And are they gonna focus on creating that new type of competition markets authority, one with the concerns of the customer really at their absolute core or will this all fall by the wayside? We're now going to get a sense of it when Alok Sharma, our Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, appoints the new chair. We've got the Bank of England, where the new governor, Andrew Bailey, was the chair of the FCA until a mere six months ago. So musical chairs a go-go. Um, then we've got the PSR, the Payment Services Regulator. That was formed a mere five years ago. So that's the baby, the, you know, the uh, newcomer to the party is 2021, the year uh, they really step out, they really take to the dance floor. Um, and then there's the Treasury, uh, a very senior participant in all of this. Uh, their latest call for evidence, uh, the payment services review is a corker, you know, get your homework in by the 20th of October. And then we've got um, the Department of Culture, Media and, of course, Sport, who are chief chap is in charge of digital identity uh, for reasons of um, peculiar history. And at the centre of the web, we've obviously got uh, the Cabinet Office. So for me, it's a confusing and confused Venn diagram with both gaps and overlaps, and both are dangerous. Right, so there's a formidable as possibly um confused mass. What do you think, Sarah? What's, what's your take on this? Is there enough regulation? Is there, does these regulations tra translate into accountability for you? I mean, I think it depends where you're looking and what you're looking at. I mean, my, my focus is almost exclusively on fintech in the UK. Um, you know, if we're going to bring it round to maybe some of the, the names that people will know about, some of the neobanks, the Monzos and the Starlings of this world, well, they are they're regulated by a number of the bodies that Louise just mentioned. Um, those regulators, in my mind, are doing their best to be supportive of those those new startups, those new banks. They want competition in the industry. Um, and the reason that they want competition is because they see that as being good for customers. Um, we have to remember that in this country, we have a regulator that has the interests of the customer as part of its mandate. That's the FCA. And that's actually really quite unusual. Um, so they have kind of an extra incentive to, to make sure that these these businesses, these fintechs are, are, are not damaging customer interests. Um, you know, we could look, for example, perhaps at the uh, the recent proposed new approach to what has been called by the regulators the non-systemic banks. Um, so for, for the average person on the street, that's not the big nine that you'd walk down the street and, and see a branch of. Um, now, if you look into that proposed approach a little bit more, it, to me, shows quite a lot of balance. Um, so what it suggests is that for those new banks that have thus far focused quite a lot on growing, so trying to get customers to compete with the big boys, um, there's now needs to be a greater focus on, on making those businesses sustainable. Um, what the, the proposed approach does is it balances the needs of both the new businesses and the customers. So it gives them time to work out a plan. It has to be a good plan. It has to be a sensible plan. Um, 
but it also you know backs up and reinforces that need that, that these businesses have to be sustainable because customers are at the heart of them right. um, and again you know Part of what the regulator wants. Um, I think it's worth looking at the fact that that approach isn't really a punishment. Um, so, mm. kind of, if you look at the regulators, there's enough accountability. The way they're looking at that approach isn't the punishment, it's trying to balance both those needs. They just want to make the new banks better than the old ones. Just a follow up question on that How realistic is sustainability during the, this ravaging pandemic? Right. Sustainability doesn't mean profitability. And I think right. people get very confused about that. So if you look at what's happened to the, the banks um, that, you know, the, a lot of them have had to look at their strategies and have a look at what to do. A lot of them, particularly the neobanks, have furloughed staff, but so have the major banks um, when you look under the cover. Um, every bank has reviewed, reviewed its strategic direction right now. OK, so it's every, every company in the UK because they want to be sustainable. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that neobanks that, you know, what's realistic, whilst you can look at their underlying financials, you can look at their customers, you can look at the way that they've um, re rethought their, their, their future, their strategy for the next one, three, five years, their lives are actually being made harder by some facets of media. Um, and I think you, it's really worth noting that a number of big media organisations in the United Kingdom are seem to be going after these banks and really right. making things look worse than they are. Um, a big a big one to pull out there is Monzo in its annual report had a comment about, uh, you know, being a going concern. Um, I won't go into the details. It's too complicated now, but quite a few businesses um, have since put that, put that warning in their annual results. And the way that it was portrayed by the media really, um, I think, didn't, was unfair. Um, we Fake could talk news. a little bit about Wirecard. I know Wirecard's been already mentioned, but I think that's uh, you know that's a slightly different topic. And the one point I would mention here is that I think part of the problem is that what customers on the street who are looking at this media, who are working out if their bank is still going to be there in a few months' time, don't necessarily understand is that Monzo and Starling are licensed banks. A lot of the companies that were using Wirecard are not licensed banks. The rules are very different. You're not quite as protected with those organisations. Um, and I think that may be where the regulator chooses to look next, particularly in the fintech, fintech industry. Oh, that's great. We had our media bashing bit. I love that. Uh, <laughs> Louise, back to your point, uh, your previous point, actually. You seem to suggest, if I understood correctly, that there's a sort of gallimaufry of regulators uh, jostling in a way to regulate this space. How do you think it should actually be structured? What would be a sensible way of looking at this? Um, I think there are probably uh, two ways to look at it. Um, the first way that we've got to look at it is from the point of view of the consumer. We've got to look, that's the lens you look through, whether it's the retail consumer, uh, whether it's the business consumer in that sense, or whether it is in fact the citizen. We've got to look at it from their point of view. Um, and rather than looking at it um, from the lens of this particular regulator, in a turf war with that regulator or um, uh, uh, the, the gaps and overlaps issue that I that I flagged. Um, I also think that we've got to, we've got a particularly tricky situation at the moment. We've obviously got the pandemic. We've obviously got uh, the fun and games of Brexit. Hmm. Um, and I think there is uh, a couple of things that I would want to see. I'd want to see a sustainability approach uh, from regulators acting in concert um, I think uh, they recognize how integral they are to upholding confidence. Um, and I think that we've got to get those regulators acting together. And what's the mechanism for those regulators working together? Um, what is the mechanism for them acting in thoughtful concert for the greater good of the country? Um, and I also think that the uh, cabinet office is the spider at the center of the web and some clear, yeah. thoughtful uh, guidance from the cabinet office would also be uh, remarkably useful in a, in a very confused and confusing time. What an image. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned Brexit. I, I hate to stir the possum here, but how do you think Brexit will play into the, this, this dynamic? Uh, Sarah, do you want to weigh in? How is Brexit going to influence the current situation and its evolution over time? Well, if I had the answer to that, I'd be a very rich person right now. Um, oh, well, what I can fine. give you is my... Be just moderately rich, <laughs> not a billionaire. <laughs> 
Um, so um, I completely agree with, with Louise's point that there needs to be more agreement between the regulators. Um, I think in terms of the, 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 the fintechs, it will depend on what they want. Um, some are quite happy here in the UK. They, they have their view for goal for sustainability requires remaining in the United Kingdom. Um, they will need, you know, cohesion between UK regulators, which will feed into a little bit of what's going on abroad. The, the fintechs and the banks, particularly that have looked at scale into Europe, um, they will be pushing hard with the regulator to ensure the regulators to ensure that their regulations here remain in line with the EU. That will make expansion easier. You know, uh, it, you have to think about the fact it's not just can they sell their products there. It's do they have to change uh, divergent, you know, will they have to diverge on surf, uh, services, on interfaces? Will they be able to access talent? Where can they bring talent? Where can they base talent? You know, what are the employee rights? Um, so they are businesses. So they will be very keen on, on making sure that the regulator knows what they want. Um, I think a no deal Brexit doesn't necessarily mean that regulation per se will fall out of line with Europe, but it is really, really too early to tell on that. Um, and just to go back, to, I completely agree with, with Louise's point. If the regulators knew what they all wanted together, it would make it a lot easier for them to fight their corner. Before we go back to Louise, I just wanted to follow up on this. Um, Sarah, uh, my, my, my sensation from reading the official papers is that the UK is far ahead of many other EU countries in this. Is this going to be an advantage post Brexit? Is it actually going? Is the UK possibly going to set the standard for the rest of the EU even after Brexit? Related to fintech regulation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I well, I think if you look at something, for example, like open banking, and I don't want to tread on Louise's toes too much here, and it's her expertise. <laughs> I'm going back there to the toes. Very much so. Um, I think we can already see other countries looking at what's been done with open banking, seeing what the UK's done, what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and taking the best bits and, 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 you know, implementing that. We have some UK companies that have taken uh, open banking based propositions to Europe um, and are working with the regulators there to help establish those standards, which will, you know, by its nature, uh, provide consistency of rules. Um, I think when it comes to the banks, the new banks regime, I think um, the UK has led the way there but most of what we've seen thus far has been global so if you look at uh, Australia as a great example they looked at what the UK had done with the new banks regime they assessed it they thought right we can make that slightly better um, so globally yes the UK uh, has um, you know led the way in, in a number of, of rules and regulations relating to fintech um, and I hope that that will serve it, uh, you know, serve both it and the UK businesses well um, in a no deal Brexit. There's always um, the possibility, of course, that people look at what the Brits are doing and go, we're going to do the exact opposite because they're British. Um, but hopefully that won't apply in this particular instance. British way. Yeah, right. Louise, do you want to weigh in on this, uh, like, like, mass of joint questions, essentially, whether Brexit is going to have a big impact, whether the UK could actually be the a trailblazer, what do you think? Um, so my sense of it with regard to Brexit is, um, is really a fallout uh, sense. Uh, let, let's look at it from the question of fallout. R regardless of, of what we end up with, how do we deal with the fallout of, of where we end up? So not making any predictions about whether it's a deal or a no deal or something super, in between. Super how do we deal with the fallout of it? Um, uh, with regard specifically to fintech and the broader financial services um, sector, I'm not confident that the government is thinking about it or has a cunning plan for how to manage that fallout. And I'm certainly not remotely confident that the opposition uh, has a clue either. Um, and that leaves us with the civil service. And the civil service's job is to enact uh, the government's vision, should should they have one. Um, and if we've got then, by logical deduction, a lack of vision, um, well, the default setting, rather worryingly, is to fall back in, on advice from the usual suspects, EY, KPMG, Deloitte, and similar. So I'm curious as to whether the civil service is curious. I'm curious as to see if they're going to look beyond the obvious and getting some retread advice from EY, KPMG, Deloitte and similar. Um, do they need, do they recognize the need for fresh thinking? And if so, what is their mechanism for accessing 
that fresh thinking. So it falls in my mind, and I think this is where Sarah was going with this, that the regulators have to be the grown-ups in the room, in which case the mechanism for them working together in a thoughtful way um, that, uh, that is for the greater good of the, of the country, but also the economy is of a critical importance. Right. Um, Sarah, do you want to add anything? Any rejoinder? Any witty uh, repartee? Rip, 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 rip <laughs> any repost? Um, no, I, I'm actually agreed. I'm agreed with Louise on this. I think, you know, the, perhaps not enough thought has been given to a sector that has such done so well and has, you know, such potential. You know, the fintech industry in this country isn't dead. There's a lot of money that is still coming in to UK based companies because of the um, excellent base we've established here. We just need to make sure that the people who are, you know, deciding what the next steps are for the country and, and, and you know, for this topic, the rules and regulations are, know how important it is, know, you know, what it can do for the country and um, make sure they listen to the people who actually know what's going on. Uh, can you give me a sense, both of you, I don't know whoever wants to jump in first, uh, let's see how it plays out. Uh, what are the areas that still need some clarity? Because at the very beginning, like the FCA was clear on some things with the sandboxes. And so there seems to be an initial impetus to provide clarity in some respect. So when we talk about lack of clarity, apart from the hodgepodge of regulation Louise referred to, what, what is missing here? What are the uh, pieces of the jigsaw that are still missing in order to make sense uh, of regulation? Um, I'm going to leap in with a couple of points, uh, one of which you, you mentioned the FCA sandbox. Really, really, really interesting point. Uh, what I'd really love to see uh, from Nikhar Rathi in this, in this uh, regard is ambition to get back into the sandbox. The original ambition for the sandbox was, was great. It was, about, um, it was about giving the FCA a kind of crystal ball into the future. It, it was about giving confidence, uh, access to the regulator for innovators so that they could go play in the sandbox and know that the regulator had a chance to really understand their business. And it now seems to have got very operational. And it seems to have got on a productivity treadmill where, where the vim, the vigor, the um, spark of inspiration, that shard of brilliance has been drummed out um, by, the, by the relentless operation of it. So I'd like to see that ambition come back in. And then to answer your question in a different way, um, where I think there's a real opportunity uh, to drive clarity, um, is in digital identity. Um, turns out, who knew, pandemics are a killer use case uh, for digital identity. Pun it's unintended. The key. Yeah, no, no. It's the um, key with which we unleash the power of personalization that predictive, those preemptive services unlocked by your ID and powered by your data. Now, digital identity, as we all know, circled the drain in the Department of Culture, Media and, support, and Sport for uh, an eternity. And the market cannot drive forward digital identity without standards and nobody uh, in history <laughs> stepped up to the plate. So we've now got a new quango. Uh, it's called the Digital Identity Strategy Board mm. in charge of developing principles in this area. Uh, guess what? There are six. Guess what? They are privacy, transparency, inclusivity, interoperability, proportionality, and good governance. So you can't really argue with any of those six. Um, but at the center of the web, and this goes back to my point about the uh, cabinet office, hmm. at the center of the web, we've got the cabinet office. So I'd like to see uh, the cabinet office minister, a certain master Michael Gove, grab this issue by the scruff of the neck and demonstrate not only his laser focus, that great intellect we know so much about, but his ability to see that bigger picture and deliver the projected multi-billion pound uplift to our economy that we so badly need, estimated at, uh, I think, 3% to our GDP by 2030. We can do with yeah. that. Let's accelerate it. We have a question from Mike from Westminster. No, we don't. Uh, Sarah, do you want to add anything about this? 
Um, in terms of areas that sort of still require clarity, I think um, to, to you know to make a call back to to an uh, area I spoke about earlier. Um, I think customer protections are in place. I think mm. we could go more strongly towards making sure uh, products are advertised, branded, and marketed towards the appropriate customers. Um, you know, to a certain extent, that would you could apply that to to the the uh, non bank providers of banking services to making sure customers understand that you know the money that's held with those providers is not covered by the financial services compensation scheme. Um, there's another area which I think uh, really we could do with perhaps taking a closer look at, which is the um, huge boom in self directed investing. Uh, you know, some of these platforms have done incredibly well, particularly over recent months for a variety of reasons. Um, but then, of course, there are an awful lot of stories about people getting in over their heads um, losing lots of money not realizing what they're doing um, and so I think that there is an opportunity to, to take a good look at uh, you know what rules are in place for what products can be offered what products can be offered to who um, and it doesn't necessarily been to you know need to be as strict as this product can only be offered to this person over this age with this much money um, but there should really be I feel a lot more uh, stringent rules around kind of how things are advertised how things are marketed and how much education is out there from the providers of these products. Right, yeah. I'd like to get um, to, to ask you a question regarding possibly the future. Uh, so, given the ongoing uncertainty, how many more fintech entrants do you foresee coming into the market, Sarah? And then, Louise. First, Sarah. <laughs> um, I'm not giving you a number. Um, I think. Oh, well, too bad. I think definitely, definitely more. Um, you know, I, I hate to repeat a point I've already made, but but the UK has established itself, particularly London, but also places like Cardiff, um, as being really good places to grow fintech businesses with really good groundings mm -hmm. in. Um, as I mentioned, money is still coming in. You know, VC money, but also private equity. Um, indeed, big bank, corporate. Corporate venture capital is coming into these businesses as well. Um, so the money's there. I think the types of propositions we see will probably change. I think we'll see a lot more targeted propositions. Uh, you only have to look at the uh, recent flood in the UK market of banking propositions targeting children um, to see that people are, you know, people people starting companies are looking more narrow. Um, the FCA is still giving out banking licenses. So Monument uh, got a license a few weeks ago, and they tie back to my earlier point, you know, they're targeting a particular group of affluent customers. They're still gaps and credit cards um, the big banks are catching up fast on general retail banking um, and on the SMB side with the banking offerages uh, offerages offerings um, but there are still gaps we should in the <laughs> there are there are still gaps in the market and I think small businesses and entrepreneurs will see those take an opportunity and as we all know when fed up is saying a recession is a really good opportunity for entrepreneurs to seize the moment and go for it and I think that will only help the fintech market continue to grow